I'm Jyoti Parikh, uh, Director of Integrated Research and Action for Development in New Delhi. I'm also in the Prime Minister's Climate Council. And I was wondering, you said you have climate change also as a priority area. What do you do? What is the work involved in gender and climate? Because energy sometimes also gets involved in gender and climate issues. So Who are you I mean, addressing the question to? To, to uh, the U.S. government, yeah. I realize I don't even have a name tag yet, so that's very fair. <laughs> Uh, thank you for your question. Uh, it's a great one. So, uh, more broadly, on gender and climate issues, I think we are aiming to do a couple of things. So, we recognize that in order to address climate change effectively, uh, that requires women's participation. So, uh, we often hear in the discourse that women are the primary victims, which we agree is, is certainly true, but uh, part of the reason why Ambassador Brevere went to Durban was really to try to shift the conversation further in the direction of women as being able to play a vital role in addressing climate change, and whether that's a political role in having a role a seat at the table in decision-making processes from the grassroots level, the community level, all the way up to the international negotiations. Uh, or whether it's an economic role, whether women as entrepreneurs, because we have a lot of data more generally, not specifically to, to climate or to the green economy per se, but more generally that women as economic actors uh, tend to contribute to, to GDP growth. And so I think um, you know, women, <clears throat> we definitely want to support women in that capacity as well. So, uh, and then finally I would say education. Um, so currently women are, are highly underrepresented in science, technology, engineering, and math. And so I think in order to be able to fill those roles in the future, that uh, women need to be provided with additional opportunities to receive education in those fields. And, and we hope very much to work with countries like India, uh, who are leaders on these issues, to, uh, to develop innovative partnerships, because uh, we'll only be effective if we work together. mitigation and adaptation. Yes. Sorry. 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 Can I introduce yourself? Hello, um, my name is Natalia Costas and I work for IUCN. Um, and I just wanted to address um, that the US government leadership on gender and climate change has really had an impact on the ground. We've worked with some of our institutions developing capacity building, and I'll talk about it later. But um, a lot of like WWF um, and other. Um, organizations who are funded by, by USID and by US projects um, are now paying more attention to gender issues because it's required by, um, by the funders as, as a funding requirement. So they have to put it in their projects, they have to report on it, and so there is this, uh, this capacity um, gap, basically, uh, that now they're, they're struggling to, um, to develop the criteria and the indicators um, to help their projects be more um, gender sensitive. So it has real impact on the ground, and we hope to see more actually. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we have. Oh, okay. is that Monique at the back? Yeah. Yes, please. I'll go from back. Yes, Monique from Redu. I have a question for uh, the presenter of the Global Alliance. Uh, I, I was looking for something about uh, focus on women also as ownerships of technology. And I, I looked through your, on your website and couldn't find anything there. And so if you can explain some more about, you know, is, do you also look at that aspect of uh, the real ownership because in, in many of our traditional um, traditional learnings and, and knowledge often the women don't end up having the ownership it's a company in India or China or somewhere so I'm wondering if there is also a focus on that to, uh, to look at that and also on your website I couldn't find who is on your board of advisors so if you can <laughs> sure. maybe give us some more information on that. Okay, thank you. Sure, thank you. 
Um, so <clears throat> ownership issues, I think, um, are something that we're thinking about. We have, uh, through the Gender Cross-Cutting Committee, um, a very robust set of recommendations, particularly around how to build women as entrepreneurs um, in this emerging market and through um, clean cook stove businesses. And so part of that will be um, not only giving women additional livelihood opportunities through businesses that exist um, or that could be created as employees around sales, maintenance, distribution, um, the creation of the technology, the design, etc., but also to um, to build entrepreneurial opportunities where women are able to create their own businesses around these technologies. And so I think um, when we get on the ground and start working on these specific programs, ownership will be something that we'll need to look very carefully at. Um, but we're very we're thinking very seriously about how to make sure women have um, uh, a role in these new markets and that these value chains that are being created are very inclusive. Um, and uh, uh, so we're thinking about that. Um, I should make a note about our website. <laughs> we are uh, relaunching it, um, and so it is definitely not as comprehensive as it could be currently. Um, and so once we've merged with the Partnership for Clean Indoor Air, um, at the end of January, you'll see an entirely new website, which will be much more comprehensive and robust, and will serve as a mechanism for the partners to really be interacting together um, it will be more of an e-platform um, than it is right now, which is more of just an informational site. Um, just a quick note about the Board of Advisors. The reason you don't see that on the site is that they have not been selected yet. So um, the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves, as I mentioned, is an initiative of the UN Foundation. So ultimately, we're responsible to the UN Foundation's board. Um, but uh, in the business plan that will be released at the end of the month, there will be... Um, several uh, pages clarifying the governance structure and so there will be an advisory board which um, will be comprised of about 10 or so members and the names of those uh, members have not been released yet but there are um, there's a short list that we are considering and reaching out to and then there will be an advisory group and so the advisory group will be um, people that serve on the working groups other sector experts that will be able to tap into for strategic advice um, as we start implementing some programmatic activities. So um, that's why it's not on the website yet, but um, as we finalize the business plan, all of those governance questions will be clarified, but ultimately we do, um, we are beholden to the UN Foundation Board as a fiduciary. Thank you. Uh, Soma and then Anoja. Soma, please. I'm uh, Soma Dutta from the Anitya Network from India. And my uh, observation is really about India, about which both of you spoke. And I believe India is part, major part of the problem with, with 800 million people still using biomass and a part of the solution as well. Um, in India, there's been a major resurgence of cook stoves in the last three to four years. And these are really those new generation, good looking uh, <laughs> metal stoves that people aspire to have. Uh, however, all of these stores cost at least 800 rupees, which is about $20. And uh, which is uh, completely out of reach for the real people who need cook stores. Can you talk into the mic? Yeah. The this is too high. This is too high. Okay. Yeah, no, that's okay now. So, uh, what I'm saying is that this bottom of the pyramid that is really the sort of worst sufferers of mm -hmm. everything that we talk about are not able to reach these bookstores. And when you talk to the manufacturers, it's always the same uh, logic that there are a whole lot of things that need to come together and it is very difficult to have bookstores that, that can be uh, supplied at that price, which is affordable. So this is an area I think that really needs to be looked at, this complete bottom of the pyramid, which nobody is looking at. The government is not looking at it. I don't think any of the manufacturers will look at it. They should, I mean, you don't expect them to anyways. So, so this is something I'd like to bring to your attention. Sure. Thank you. Any, does anybody want to say, respond? Yeah. Sure. Um, I mean, I think that's a very critical point. It's something that's brought up to us often. It is. Um, okay. And it, it's something that we have thought a lot about. Uh, one of the slides that I actually took out of my presentation to keep to the time um, <laughs> was on customer segmentation. And the way that we're looking at uh, the customer segments 
Um, and so we've uh, divvied the customer segmentation into three different types of customers. And in the first phase, which is the first three years, so the next three years, um, we will not be targeting necessarily the poorest of the poor at the base of the pyramid because of the issues that you've just mentioned, the price points, et cetera. But we will be looking at vulnerable populations in crisis settings um, and looking at how to bring technologies to those settings, whether it is, it, it may be um, a stove that's given away for free in, in, a, in a crisis, but then how to perhaps build a market in a post-conflict setting. So uh, we are very aware that those are very complicated issues and that these mass manufactured stoves are above the price point that people can afford. Um, but we're working really closely with these manufacturers to develop innovative um, consumer finance, looking at the NFIs, looking at the ways that they can tap into carbon finance, um, and looking at subsidies and, and perhaps the need to bring down the price of these stoves through subsidies. Um, and also, we are supportive of local manufacturers and, and stoves that are at a lower price point, um, understanding that people need to gradually climb up the technology ladder. So um, it's something that if you, <laughs> if you have thoughts on it, we would love your input because it's something that we hear a lot and we are um, trying to address it by segmenting the customer base a little bit. Um, but definitely, uh, particularly in India where a lot of these mass manufactured stoves are being promoted, um, there are populations that are being left out by that by that technology. So, um, I welcome your thoughts. <laughs> okay, and I had one more Very point uh, yes. to make, which is that uh, you spoke about women in the supply chain. So, mm -hmm. I assume you'd also be looking at things like fuel processing and mm -hmm. all that, right? Yes, of course. Yes. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Anuja from Sri Lanka. Thank you. I am uh, Anuja Vikramasinghe from Sri Lanka. My the question is for Corinne again. Um, in Sri Lanka, you know, when we turn back, food stores had been there over 70 years or so. Uh, started with Saro there, then Ceylon Electricity Board, that the state arm for energy, and then a lot of NGOs are working on it. As you know, Corinne, if I am a user, if I am end of the chain, and I depend on your supply. There are hundreds of models of cook stores, right? In the market, if I, as a woman, if I go to the market, I will see that several models are available. Mm -hmm. Now, what we are doing in Sri Lanka is that there's a national committee appointed by the government to uh, look into the standardization of cook stores which is a hard task, I'm a member of the committee, which is a hard task. How to standardize cook stores? <laughs> who decide, who select stores, who justify the models that are in the market? So I would like to know, Corinne, you must have seen my paper perhaps on clean cook stores, which is coming up on Energy Policy Journal in December. Now, these are the sort of things that confuse the end users. Mm -hmm. We talk about cook stores, we invisibly we talk about women who cook meals for us, right? So under these circumstances, I would like to know, Corinne, in any of these countries, whether people have done any research or studies on the satisfaction level of these models. Mm -hmm or the gender responsiveness of these models. Because in Sri Lanka, in spite of that history, only 4% of the households are using improved cook stores. Mm. That is the real, situ real situation. Mm. They have their own improved stores, but they are not categorized as sort of technically improved mm. stuff mm. that are suitable to reduce all the issues or the interest issue that you and we discuss in broader forums. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent comment. Uh, Lauren, anyone uh, just <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, Those are some uh, excellent points, and I'm not going to pretend to be an expert on cook stove standards because it's certainly not uh, my expertise. However, um, it's great to hear that Sri Lanka is, um, has created this national committee to look at standardization. Um, as I mentioned, it's a key priority for the alliance. And so 
the, prior, the, the process that we've gone through essentially is um, at the last uh, Partnership for Clean Indoor Air Forum, um, several, a, a large group of the cook stove manufacturers, distributors, the, biz the businesses that were at the forum got together and created what is called the Lima Consensus, which was a, a document that outlined some basic principles that they would all agree upon um, regarding the standardization of cook stoves around efficiency and emissions. From that process, the Alliance also had a standards and testing working group led by Tammy Bond, one of the leading researchers on cook stove um, technology in the United States, um, and one of her Chinese colleagues, and Tammy actually now lives in China to, and is working on this, um, to create this tiered standard that I was talking about. So there will be specific, um, so again, I'm not <laughs> an expert in this, but what my understanding is uh, from what the committee is now working on, they are, they are asking all of the stove manufacturers from all over the world, um, including uh, reaching out to smaller manufacturers and local in-country manufacturers through our partners, to uh, test their stoves through some of the laboratories that are available around the world, report on those test, uh, test results using specific testing protocols that have been designed and agreed upon um, in, previous, uh, in previous documents, such as the Shell benchmarks. Those stove tests, uh, those, the testing results of those stoves will be plotted on a chart, and then there will be a consultation process to decide where the tier, where the lines of the tier are drawn, because obviously people are very sensitive about where their stove falls on the tier. Um, that tiered standard will then go into the ISO process, which is an intergovernmental process where country governments will talk about the standard and agree upon it um, and voluntarily adopt it or not. Hopefully, it will. Um, and so it's great to, to know that Sri Lanka is thinking specifically about this um, and would love to get your contact information and make sure that you're looped into the process that's going on with the Alliance because I think it sounds like you have a lot of valuable um, expertise to be bringing into that. Uh, I hope that answers that uh, process a little bit. Um, and then just quickly about the, yeah, the, light, the, the customer satisfaction piece. Um, the Alliance is going to commission specific research looking at um, the customer satisfaction of different kinds of stove models, particularly um, with sex disaggregated information around what women like versus men and the different priorities and needs that they have of these technologies, and also looking at what kinds of labeling may need to be done on these technologies, sort of following the Lighting Africa model in terms of how to make sure the customers understand the standardization of the stoves. Um, uh, so I'll stop there, but hopefully that gives you some information and insight into it. Uh, sorry, because of time difference, I can take maybe one one more question. I'll take Govin the uh, Kelka first, and then okay, Monique, you get one quick one. Um, who's that? Sorry, I can't see you. Um, I think um, uh, Govin, can you come first, and then I'll, I'll have an idea. Okay. I think we should get fifteen. I will be brief. My first. Uh, can I? Yes. Yes. Okay. I wanted to reinforce what uh, Thyagarajan has said, that capacity development is very crucial in terms of at every stage and particularly in the beginning, because uh, it should not be forgotten that IFAD does a major work in terms of land distribution to women and others and I was involved. And one of the, mo one of the uh, means that, uh, or the method that they have selected is really capacity development of from top to bottom. They started from the top management and then they went to project managers. So capacity development is the means for sustainability. I wanted to reinforce that. My second question is really, which is a question, to Justin about, uh, thank you for uh, uh, calling that India and the industrial houses as the kind of uh, center of attention and it does need some help. But you did talk in passing about the, your third area where the US government is a kind of paying attention, that is the participation in, women's participation in economic and political uh, governance, did you say? Yes. But I did not. So I think uh, political participation has acquired a lot of attention now, 50% at the local level, uh, in the panchayats or the right. village council. But what is needed and where the attention has not been paid, and you also didn't say much, is the economic participation. Because women are still seen as one of the black box of the household. 
what happened, they are the attached category in poverty reduction program and other things. They are never seen as the independent economic citizen. So I wanted to uh, know. Thank you. Well, thank you so much for, for raising that point because economic participation is one of the most important, if perhaps not the most important, uh, aspects of, of women's empowerment, I think. Uh, as the data shows from the World Bank and other sources, when you invest in women entrepreneurs, it leads to, uh, to GDP growth. And so, particularly in this economic environment, we really can't afford not to, not to invest in women. And I think, uh, as was mentioned earlier, there are a number of barriers to that. I think access to finance is a huge barrier that, that still needs to be overcome in, in a lot of different ways. Um, whether it's access to markets or capacity building, uh, there are so many things that need to be done to ensure that women have access to the markets that they need in order to play a full role uh, in uh, the formal economy. So thank you very much for raising that. And I will also flag, uh, Secretary Clinton gave a major speech back in September um, on women in the economy. And it really was a watershed speech in that it laid out using very concrete economic data that, uh, that, that showed the argument. Um, and so I would reference you to that, and I'm happy to share a copy of that.